All right. Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 8 a.m. Pacific time, 10 a.m. Central time. So the session is uh, started. Uh, we're going to wait just a minute or so for more people to come online. Uh, but in the meantime, I just want to give you all a quick introduction to the session and to our speakers and panelists today. Uh, my name is Kenny Wallen. I'm at the University of Idaho. I have a joint position with Idaho Fish and Game. And I'm going to be your session host uh, today um, and sort of panel facilitator. So the rest of my, my friends and colleagues are making up the rest of the presenters and panelists. Uh, we have Emma McKinley. She's joining us from University of Cardiff in Wales. Uh, Stefan Partlow is at the Leibniz Center for Tropical Biology. He's joining us from Berlin, Germany. Uh, his collaborator is Michael Cox. He's at Dartmouth College here in the US. Uh, my colleagues on the Conservation Social Science Community Network are Nia Morales, Wiley Carr, and Ashley Gramza. And we have Jessica Austin joining us from University of Colorado Boulder, presenting the uh, Social Science Extreme Research Network with her colleague, Lori Peake. And Rudy Schuster is also joining us from Colorado and Fort Collins from USGS, presenting on the HDGov and some of the community of practice he is developing for the Department of Interior here in the US. So all in all, you know, a lot of us have been interested in connecting one another in uh, this very dispersed world of, uh, of natural resource social science or conservation social science, environmental social science or marine social science, whatever you'd like to call it. Um, we've often all just come to the same conclusion that no matter what context or setting we're working in, we're all in the same boat. We're all working towards the same goals but we've also found it very difficult to identify one another, to make ourselves known to each other. Um, so in terms of that professional capacity, a lot of our networks are geared towards that, are geared towards connecting people who have expertise in one field or experience in another field. Um, and then another side of this is some of the uh, mix of professional and personal, some of the, the shared experiences, um, shared wisdom that we can all learn from one another, sometimes using these networks, um, and in particular, uh, Stefan and, and Michael's podcast to be somewhat cathartic to understand that a lot of people are going through the same things that we are and struggling with the same things and dealing with the same things and understanding how everyone might have uh, a different path, but might all be sort of similar in how and where they're trying to go with it. So at the end of the day, a lot of what we're trying to do is very aligned with the theme of the conference this year, which is connecting natural resource social sciences and broadening that global network. Um, so today's uh, symposium is organized with pre-recorded talks. So here in a minute, I'm gonna go ahead and let those run. Uh, we're gonna start off with Emma's talk on the Marine Social Science Network, and we're gonna go into Jessica's talk on the social research uh, extreme events. And then we're going to jump into the Conservation Social Science Community Network, then the HDGov and Department of Interior Capacity or Community of Practice. And then we're going to finish off with uh, Stefan and Michael's In Common podcast. So those are our talks. Those are going to last about 40 minutes. So the idea here is for you all to sit back and enjoy those talks if you haven't already looked at them, because um, some of them are online on the Whova app. But yeah, join us for these first 40 minutes. And then afterwards, for the rest of the session time, we're going to have a panel discussion um, with everybody you see here pinned on the screen. And so anyway, hold all of your questions uh, until later. But if you do have any questions you want to write, um, please go ahead and put them in the chat here in Zoom. And then if they're specific to one of the speakers or talks uh, or networks, go ahead and put that in parentheses. So just kind of me, I'm going to be facilitating. So just sort of guide me. So if it's going through five talks or so, I might get lost on what question or what talk it was pertaining to. So go ahead and do me a favor and um, put that in the chat, if you will. All right. Just uh, one more thing. The um, session is being recorded. So everybody just be on your best behavior and just remember that. And um, we'll go ahead and get started. So just bear with me. Um, 
when I do the talks, I'm actually going to mute myself. I'm going to take myself off video. Um, I would encourage everyone else to do that as well. And I'm just going to take a moment to share my screen and get Emma's talk up. And then I'll jump back on in between each talk for a few seconds to introduce the next. Hi everybody, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this session today. Um, I'm here to talk to you about the Marine Social Science Network and I'm going to give you a really whistle-stop tour into its creation and some of the lessons we've learned over the last couple of years. So the Marine Social Science Network has been running since about 2018. We were developed from a stakeholder workshop that was run in London on a very cold, chilly January day in 2018 where we brought together 35 different stakeholders um, representing academia, consultancy, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, to talk to them about whether or not there was scope and need for a marine social science community in the UK. So firstly, we wanted to understand more about how marine social sciences could feed into UK marine and coastal policy and management at the time, but also was there a need for a network, was there a need for a community? And resoundingly, the answer was yes, but also there was a feeling um, that there were a number of other gaps and kind of opportunities for marine social sciences that were moving forward. There was a feeling that there was an identity issue, that marine social sciences was often undervalued. There's a lack of funding to support marine social science research and the application of research, but also a gap in evidence and capacity, both within the research community, but also more so at the time in the practitioner and policy community. So there's a real need to improve connectivity and think about how we could work better together across disciplines, across sectors and across policy areas. And so we felt, therefore, that there was a real opportunity to build on this developing and emergent community of marine social scientists and, and practitioners. We felt during this workshop that there was a need for that, the, the network to be something that was not UK focused, but that was externally focused and looking out to the wider globe and um, to improve public connectivity and engagement with marine and coastal issues, to build on that growing interest and capacity and to bridge the gap, perhaps, between natural and social sciences. We really wanted to work together to demonstrate the role of social sciences within the wider marine science community. And as a result, Marine Social Science Network was born. We launched officially at the Greenwich Maritime Centre Society in the Sea Conference in September 2018. And we take a very, very broad brush definition of what we mean by marine social sciences. So essentially, we mean everything to do with understanding the relationship between people and the ocean, coasts and seas, and all the other bits in between. So you'll expect to see things like psychology, sociology, economics, and um, as you would kind of the, the, the traditional social science disciplines, perhaps. But we also are broadening out, including things like arts and humanities, and thinking about how our heritage researchers can contribute to our understanding of that complex relationship. As I said, really taking that broad brush definition of what we mean by marine social sciences as much as possible. We also really want to advocate and promote and demonstrate the opportunity to think outside the normal toolbox of questionnaires and interviews, perhaps, and really highlight and showcase the diversity of disciplines and, and opportunities and approaches that can be used to understand the relationship between people in the ocean. So a lot of the work we're doing through various different things is to try and highlight those opportunities and, and really make them um, more apparent to communities. So we have a number of main aims. Our biggest goal has been to create a platform or a community where researchers and practitioners working across marine social sciences can feel like they've got a home. So that's been our first goal since we launched in 2018. I think we've managed to do that. Crucially, we are not an exclusive network. So we really welcome everybody and we really try and highlight that need for interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity across dialogues and collaborations. So if you're a marine biologist, if you're not a marine person at all, but you want to know more about what we do, then very much you are welcome and we, we try to meet, be as inclusive as possible. And as I said, part of what we're trying to do is really highlight the role of social sciences as a gateway, as, an, as, a, um, as a parallel evidence need, an evidence gap for ocean policy and management. So we want to think about how social sciences can contribute towards global challenges, can be evidence for policy and, and management development, and really position social sciences. And as I said, remembering that we mean that in a really broad, broad sense. So including arts, including humanities, but including that alongside natural and physical sciences. 
I don't do all of this on my own. I have an amazing committee behind me with a great comms team who support the development of our newsletter, two fantastic co-chairs and Catherine Yates and Tim Aycott, um, an international officer who's coordinating the development of our, of our regional chapters. So far, we have kind of expanded while the network is a global entity. We also have regional chapters that really highlight and raise the profile of specific needs for those communities. So we have Mars Oxide Australia, MARC, Mars Marine Social Science Network Ireland. We have an emerging group in India happening at the moment and also a thematic group around adaptive capacity that's hosted through um, Oregon and the University of Oregon. So we're really active. We're trying to really engage with our communities through a range of different ways. We have our website, we have our newsletter, um, and we have a really active Twitter um, profile as well, which are really welcome to engage with if you'd like to. You can join Team Marsoc Sci through engaging with the website, of course, following us on our social media platforms, including Twitter and Instagram, and we're looking at other op options in the coming months. We also have a monthly newsletter, as I mentioned, um, and we run a webinar series and um, book club as well. So there's loads of ways to get involved and to network in different ways with the wider marine social science community. But there are some lessons that we've learned over the last three years or so. So we felt that we really needed to think about what our purpose was, what we're trying to achieve as a community of researchers and of practitioners. And that was to create a space for marine social sciences, for the scientists, for the researchers, for the policymakers to have those conversations and really raise the profile of that work, to make sure that those conversations are happening. It's crucial when you're developing these sorts of networks and communities that you invest realistic time and energy into building the brand or the recognition of the network. So piggybacking on events, we did that a lot. We were thinking about how we can work with other groups to build our own, you know, to develop mul multiple benefits for all, mutual benefits for all. One size won't fit all. So that's why, although we have the Mars Oxide brand, we also have our regional and thematic chapters, recognizing that what we do as a kind of global network, it might not fit the needs of the community in Australia, the needs of the community in India. And so it's really important that we're flexible and adaptive and we respond to things as they happen. Part of that has been responding to COVID-19 and you know, not being able to do all the in-person networking we were expecting to do in 2020. And that birthed the book club and the webinar series. So being responsive and adaptive to circumstances is really crucial. We have built trust. We've worked with um, our a number of different collaborators and we've fostered partnerships to kind of help promote what we're doing and work really closely with different organizations. And it means that we promote each other. So we have the Future Earth Coast group, which is um, hosted in Germany. And um, we have the, um, the Skimmer magazine who's posted some um, and hosted some information about Mars Oxide as well. So it's really important that we've worked together and we're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're trying to all achieve the same goal, essentially. So you can do a lot on a limited or in our case, no budget, but it does take passion. It takes goodwill and definitely some Sunday mornings and some late nights over the last couple of years. But what we've really found to be super useful is to keep going back to our community. So we've, we've developed some outputs through workshops we run. We run a monthly, um, sorry, an annual um, feedback questionnaire. We try to go back to people and ask them, you know, how can the community, how can the network be useful for you? And that's something that I think has worked really, really well. We never wanted this to be a top-down kind of approach. It's very much community-led, bottom-up, um, to try and make sure that we're delivering a network and a community that's useful for everyone. So after that really whistle-stop tour, I just wanted to kind of leave you with this quote that highlights the importance of why we need to think about marine social sciences and why the network, in my view, is so important. Of course, ecological sciences, natural sciences are hugely, hugely important. We need to understand how our natural systems work but also if we want to transform those systems, if we want to realize the change that's being set out as a challenge and um, facing our global environments, we need to understand people, conservation, management, they're all about people. So for me, those social science elements are, are crucial and fundamental to achieving that transformation that we're seeking across our environmental management and policy. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking forward to a really active discussion and look forward to taking any of your questions. Good morning. And All right. Thanks, Emma, for your talk. So next up, we're going to, Jessica Austin's going to present on the Social Science Extreme Events Research Network Map and the work that they're doing at the University of Colorado Boulder and the Converge program they have there with NSF. Uh, again, in the chat, if you do have any questions for Emma for the Mars Sci, go ahead and put those there and make sure you just sort of tag it with uh, 
Emma or with Marcel's side so I know who to direct the questions to. Welcome to the Social Science Extreme Events Research or SCR project. My name is Jessica Austin and I'm a graduate research assistant at the Natural Hazard Center, the data manager for the SCR project and a PhD candidate in sociology at the University of Colorado Boulder. This video provides an overview of the National Science Foundation supported SCR network, which is part of the larger Converge initiative headquartered here at CU Boulder. Over the next few minutes, I would like to share more about the SCR mapping project, including the motivation that led to the creation of SCR, our mission, details on how social science hazards and disaster researchers can join the network, and information on how the SCR web map helps to advance our mission. First, I'd like to acknowledge the hard work and essential contributions of the SCR team at the Natural Hazard Center, including our principal investigator and director of the Hazard Center, Lori Peake, our data analyst, Heather Champeau, and our NSF research experience for undergraduate student assistant, Neva Laurent. Disasters happen on average once each day around the world. And although disaster data are sometimes disputed, most experts agree that we have seen an increase in both the number of disasters and the number of people affected by disasters over the past four decades. More disasters result in more deaths and injuries, damages, displacement, and societal disruption. These issues are of grave concern, not only to disaster researchers, but to public officials, the private sector, and concerned citizens as well. For decades, social and behavioral scientists have been working together and increasingly in multi and interdisciplinary teams to address the grand challenges related to rising disaster losses. The SCR network was formed in part to respond to the need for more specific information about the status and expertise of the social science hazards and disaster research workforce. Core to the mission of SCR is to identify and map social scientists involved in hazards and disaster research in order to highlight their expertise and connect social science researchers to one another, to interdisciplinary teams, and to communities at risk to hazards and affected by disasters. Ultimately, the goals of SCR are to amplify the contributions of social scientists, to advance the field through expanding the available social science evidence base and to enhance collective well being. The National Science Foundation now supports seven extreme events research networks or EERs. You can see from this graphic that many of these networks reside in the physical sciences and engineering. SCIR is the network specifically for social science hazards and disaster researchers. In August of 2018, Lori Peak wrote a call to social scientists and invited those who self-identify as social and behavioral scientists to join the SCR network. At that time, as well as now, we took a broad and inclusive definition to the social sciences. We included 23 different disciplines in the original survey, including, for example, sociology, anthropology, psychology, and political science, as well as public health and medicine, urban planning, and several other disciplines that have contributed to the understanding of the societal dimensions of hazards and disasters. The SCR survey allows us to answer key questions about the hazards and disaster workforce. For example, how many social science hazards and disaster researchers are there? Between August 2018 and June 2021, 1,232 hazards and disaster researchers have joined the SCR network. Where are these researchers located? Most SCR researchers are located in the Americas. However, researchers also reside in Europe, Asia, Oceania, and Africa. What disciplines do they represent and what is their topical and methodological expertise? The most frequently represented disciplines among SCR researchers are disaster science, geography, and sociology. 
and methods most frequently used include case studies, survey research, and in-depth interviews. With the answers to these and other questions, SCR represents a first attempt to generate a census or an official count of social scientists who study hazards and disasters. Our goal in creating the SCR web map is to turn the SCR census data into a tool that makes it easier for hazards and disaster researchers to identify potential research partners before and during disaster and to form interdisciplinary research teams. This web map application combines information regarding what SCR researchers do with their geographic location in ways that we hope will facilitate the process of advancing the ethical conduct of hazards and disaster research and creating research partnerships. During a disaster, this web map application can be used to find locally affected researchers to ensure that their voices, knowledge, and expertise are recognized and included. Before and during disaster, the map can be used to find researchers by discipline, by methodological expertise, by the types of hazards one studies, and by the events that a researcher has studied. This information can be used in many ways, including to form teams, to develop collaborative research proposals, and to create memorandums of understanding with government agencies. We hope that by making the SCR census data available in a web map, we can help make the process of forming hazard and disaster teams and partnerships more effective, more efficient, and more inclusive. Thank you for watching this video today. The SCR network was created with funding support from the National Science Foundation and with the generous response of the social science hazards and disaster research community. The Natural Hazard Center team also recognizes our partners at ESRI who have supported the creation of the SCR web map application. Thank you so much for the important work you do and thank you for your interest in SCR. Please check out the links to the web map and our publications. Our de-identified data set is also available on the Design Safe platform. If you are a social scientist who studies hazards and disasters, we hope you will join us. For all others, we hope you will benefit from the enormous wealth of knowledge the members of this vibrant community have generated over the years. Welcome everyone. Thanks Jessica for your talk. Um, I have to agree. I think the, uh, the natural disasters, extreme events research is somewhat overlooked, uh, especially in my world dealing with natural resource management and wildlife. Um, but Jessica's team there at University of Colorado Boulder with Lori Peak, it's very extensive and very impressive, everything that they have done um, that she just gave us a quick little walkthrough. Um, a related uh, network initiative um, is being presented next with Nia Morales from the University of Florida. And I'll get that queued up right now. Everyone, I'll be talking about the Conservation Social Sciences Community Network, and I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge my collaborators here, Kenny Wallen of University of Idaho, Wiley Carr of the National Park Service, and Ashley Gramza of Playa Lakes Joint Venture. So first, I'd just like to give some brief background about the project. Originally, Dr. Wallen was interested in understanding conservation social science capacity outside of academia, and so he reached out to um, his colleagues, us, who were working for state and federal agencies at the time. And we um, understood that many states and agencies had people working on human dimensions issues, some titled, some not. And there wasn't one singular directory that encompassed state, federal, academic, NGO um, folks who were doing this type of work. So we decided we wanted to develop a community of practice, not just a directory. We needed a way to identify colleagues so that we could better collect with, connect with them and a, need a tool to leverage expertise, build networks, and collaborate on projects that might affect whole regions and large-scale issues. For HD specialists themselves, this network would be helpful because oftentimes we were the only person who was doing this type of work in our agency or organization. So it helped us, um, we thought it would help to better connect people who could give suggestions or edits on project, create a community if you had to vent about 
um, you know, issues in your job that, you know, other social scientists might um, be able to empathize with, or just to build a professional network for future career advancement, to share job postings for organizations and agencies that you may not have known about otherwise. And basically, that's what we meant by building a community of practice, just sort of a clearinghouse for all things conservation social science. So we'll get into the specifics of how the site works first, but I just wanted to introduce you to the page. There's um, several opportunities to join and register. So you have the one on the right. At the top, there's also a link to join. Right now, we have over 100 entries representing several different countries and continents, um, US and Canada, Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, Central and South America. In the beginning, we sent targeted recruitment emails out to our own networks and asked people to pass the word along. So we kind of snowballed this um, as we went along. We also presented the network at several professional meetings um, and with various wildlife societies, like, like the Wildlife Society, um, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and the regional associations of fish and wildlife agencies, as well as other conferences. And also, if we had colleagues who were looking for collaborative research, we referred them to the site so that they could find um, other people who had similar expertises or um, complementary expertise. For any individual person that um, signs up for the network, we collect a lot of different information that you can then see reflected on the page. So we connect, collect information about your affiliation, your job title, expertise, your role, whether you're a practitioner or what we call an ally or a champion, and your website or social media info. We uh, struggled in the beginning on how to define what a social scientist was, and we ended up keeping it open-ended after lots of discussion about what counts as a social scientist and maybe what doesn't count. We decided it'd be letter, better to let people define themselves um, what expertise they had. The only thing that we currently don't include is students, pre-professionals. Um, the reason we did this was because we wanted to make sure that the network included people who are currently in a professional role. So unless you're a student who might be a graduate student and working somewhere, we haven't actually started recruiting um, uh, students into this uh, directory. So I'm going to get rid of my little uh, video box for a second so you can see the full map and I'm going to go over some of the features of the site. So the first feature you might notice here is that we have color coded dots and these dots correspond to different types of organizations, um, tribal, indigenous, federal, state, etc. You can filter by these different um, components if you would like to look at specific types of organizations um, or categories. You can also search for an individual member. So you have that query box there and it'll take you directly to that person um, if, you are, if you know who it is you're looking for. And so that'll bring up, for example, that's me. And you can see all the attributes that are associated with that person's name in the query. So if we zoom out a little bit here, I'll take you through um, one of the dots to take a look. So you can zoom in by area. And you'll see here that the predominant feature there was federal. Um, and then if you zoom in again, let's find an individual here and zoom to the features. You can see there are 11 people in this particular cluster of dots. You have their information here, their associations and affiliations, and then also their websites which you can click out and it'll open a new window that features their, their website or social media account. And here we can take a look at the process of signing up for the network. So you'll see the main page has a little bit of information. It talks about the different domains or categories of expertise that we are um, categorizing people by. So it's pretty simple. You know, you put your information in, you put your uh, address or location.
And so you can also put the organization, division, department, your title, what type of organization, um, your address. Whether you're a practitioner or researcher or a champion or ally. And then you can um, sort of open ended put the areas of expertise or practice that you are, um, that you do. And eventually we will do some follow up um, surveys about uh, the state of our field. We haven't really gotten those projects off the ground yet. Um, but if you are interested, when you're filling out the, um, the form here, you just click yes, and then your name will go into a set, uh, a list that we might contact for future studies. So we've gone through the features of the site um, and the different components of the map and how you can sign up. And what else are we trying to do? Uh, so we have a Twitter page. Um, it's a bot. So if you hashtag consocialsci on any of your posts, it'll connect to this Twitter feed. And that's a, just a place for you to share research that you're doing, connect um, your networks together, and basically just um, try to build this, this community of practice. This session is another way that we're trying to connect other efforts to expand this community. So you'll hear from um, some of the other folks here who have different networks, podcasts, and, and other social science, not social science, social events um, designed to connect this community together. Some of the things we'd like to do in the future is to build the directory with targeted recruitment of state, federal, tribal, and NGO practitioners. It's still pretty difficult to find um, who some of these folks are. We've tried to go through our own professional networks, but you know that can only lead so far. And I know that we don't have a total uh, inclusive list of all the different agencies and organizations that have social scientists on payroll. So we'd really like to build this out um, and get more targeted recruitment of some of these missing groups. We'd also like to partner with organizations who will use or embed the map on their websites. So again, we're designing this so that it can be a global directory um, you know, we focus a lot of our efforts on the U.S. and Canada right now because that's kind of where we're located and situated. But we really would like this thing to grow its own legs and, um, you know, really take off. And we'd like to work with similar initiatives to collaborate on what's next. I know that there are several of these directory or map um, projects around, and maybe there's a good way to consolidate all of these together so that we can have a giant list of all of these um, uh, people with all this different expertise to create this giant community of practice. And with that, I'll end. So thank you for your attention here. And I look forward to answering questions on the panel. Thank you. Hello, my name is. All right. Thanks, Nia. Yeah, I have to agree. Um, we do want that network to, to grow legs and, and kind of connect with a lot of these other initiatives. Um, and one in particular is what um, Rudy Schuster is going to be presenting next, which is a lot of his work he's been doing on the federal side here in the US with HDGov and the Department of Interior. Um, and as Nia mentioned, um, for a lot of us, uh, state and federal agencies in the US can be a bit opaque, so partnering with someone like Rudy and his initiatives is a big, big positive for a lot of us and a lot of the work that he's doing to make um, some of the things in the background of the federal service a little bit more public facing, um, working with folks at US Fish and Wildlife Service as he'll discuss uh, has been beneficial to us and um, a lot of us trying to, to figure out who our colleagues and potential collaborators are in the wide world of conservation and social science. And just a quick little plug, I know Nia mentioned the map as a useful way to find collaborators, but for any of you who happen to be associate editors like myself, uh, it's also a useful way to find potential reviewers for papers. So just keep that in mind. All right, next up, Rudy Schuster from the US Geological Survey. Hello, my name is Rudy Schuster. I work for the United States Geological Survey which is in the Department of the Interior. I'm chief of the social and economic analysis branch located in beautiful Fort Collins, Colorado. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how social scientists in the Department of Interior have been navigating the human dimensions landscape, 
specifically efforts surrounded um, on or, or centered on HDGov, Human Dimensions Gov, and the Department of the Interior, Social, Behavioral, and Economic Community of Practice. HDGov is a website. It was created at least 18 years ago with the intention of being a clearinghouse of information to help inform decision making. You can see on the upper left text there some of the benefits or intended outcomes of peer-to-peer -peer learning, providing timely and relevant information, um, providing it to diverse disciplines about human dimensions and its application to decision making. To be honest, the website struggled for a long time trying to attract attention to itself. And after a while, the leadership committee came up with the idea of creating these subgroups, these teams. You can see a circle in the upper corner there on the tab for teams. Of, of people who would have their own reason for being part of this community. And they, those individual teams would, would create a user base who would contribute content to the site through their own teams and create a larger community. The interesting thing in the evolution of this website is that creating those teams was a landmark where a website transitioned into a community. What I'd like to draw your attention to now is the ribbon on the left side, and that is the actual graphic of the home page for the website. We tried to create a website that was very inviting, that, that do doesn't look and feel like your average everyday government website. The leadership committee worked with some graphic designers to create this page, and it's one of those sites that you can scroll down. The logos that you see are, are all the folks who are represented currently on the leadership committee um, and, and the leadership committee gets together and has conversations and, and makes decisions about the direction for the website and what we're going to be doing. This is a picture of a logic model and it's in process. This is happening right now. The leadership committee is working on, on taking actions, right, to, 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 to achieve the intended outcomes that we have. And those intended outcomes are as we just said at the, on the very first slide, you know, what the website is intended to do. The important thing to note here is the activities. And so every community of practice is, is, is centered on some specific thing. And in this case, all of these activities are relevant to the context of trying to be a community of practice that lives within a website, within a web application. Um, so that's, that's an interesting way of looking at a community of practice. Second thing that we want to talk about is the Department of the Interior Social Behavioral Economic Community of Practice, a very long name to accomplish the mission that we have at the very top of the slide, to foster engagement among social science practitioners and allied professionals across the Department of the Interior. The benefits and functions of this community of practice, again, are, are not much different from a lot of the others that you're going to see. However, it is specific to Department of the Interior bureaus and offices. DOI bureaus and offices all have missions, right? Where you have a common goal of managing land and waters within Department of Interior's jurisdiction, but we all have different ways of going about it. And the concept here is this community of practice is gonna help us work across those multiple jurisdictions and leverage resources in order to be able to best accomplish our, our goals or simply to do our jobs. Where did we come from? Where are we going? Well, in the early 2000s, there was a group of social scientists in the Beltway from multiple bureaus, offices, and agencies that would just get together, essentially, and have lunch and talk shop about social science. It was called the Social Science Roundtable. Well, that grew and grew to where there were actual formal you know, meetings and people were calling in from across the country. Well, out of that demand grew this formal structure where we actually have a large organization now, 18 or so years later, um, where we are talking to each other. And again, membership driven. So a little bit about who we are and how it functions. Well, how many cooks are in the kitchen? Who's doing this stuff? Well, in 2017 or so, there actually were a group of economists from the Department of Interior who got together and have a workshop, a DOI economics workshop. A few of us non-economic social scientists saw that and thought that it was an amazing effort and, and decided that it would be really nice if we had this for the larger community. We got together and, and talked enough to write down an invitation 
which was sent out to a larger planning team. And that group of people, the planning team, then created enough structure about what a community of practice would be to facilitate having a virtual multi-day kickoff meeting where we had about 90 people participating. The outcome of that really was to identify what the needs are within Department of Interior for a community of practice. From that precipitated what we call the A-teams, the action teams, and I'll show you in a second what those are, but those action teams were the, the groups of people, subgroups, who are actually charged with making things happen associated with the community of practice. And recently we had our first round table event for, for the larger community, which had about 185 people participating in it. These are the action teams. And the size of the text is just a function of how many characters are in there. It has nothing to do with importance. But those 15 people are on the action teams, which are spread out across these different groups who, again, go out and, and do things associated with the community. And we all get back together and have larger action team meetings in order to help uh, create um, action and progress and get things done for the larger group. 15 people, 10 teams. If anyone works within the Department of Interior and would like to volunteer, please let us know. Finally, the last real slide here is an example of what the round table was that we had in May. And, and the important thing here is not necessarily the topic, which is a timely and important topic. It's that we had the Deputy Secretary for Water and Science give us opening remarks. And we we're all very excited and happy about this, not just the fact that, that she actually accepted the invitation, but during her opening comments, acknowledged the work that we're doing, uh, lended a great deal of support to the work, and, and really it was just exciting that she was there and supporting the social science work that we do within the Department of Interior. With that, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to be here with you today, and I look forward to an engaging conversation the rest of our time in this session as well as throughout the entire meeting. Thanks, Rudy. Um, next up, we're going to listen to Stefan talk about his work on the In Common podcast with Michael Cox. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about these previous four talks in relation to what Michael and Stefan are doing with In Common and kind of the evolution of their initiative and kind of their approach to working with networks and community of practices. Hello everyone, my name is Stefan Partolo and today I'm going to be talking about podcasting as network and community building and I'm going to give the example of our podcast called the In Common Podcast, which you can find there at our website. So what are podcasts? Podcasts are digital audio files which are made available through the internet and they're typically run through RSS feeds. So most of them are free and you can use a variety of different apps, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, for example, to catch those RSS feeds, subscribe to podcasts and to download the audio files and listen. There are a lot of different formats of podcasts, including talk shows, interviews, edited narratives, storytelling, journalism, science communication, et cetera. So it's a growing medium and there's many, many new podcasts coming out every month. So a little bit about our podcast, which is called the In Common Podcast. It's a, it's a weekly it's a weekly show where we feature interviews on human environment relationships uh, focused on academia and practice research. It started by myself uh, and Michael Cox in 2019 as we both enjoy listening to podcasts and we wanted to provide an open space for discussions about environmental social science and environmental governance related topics. Really, we want to build community and networks without barriers. Um, podcasts are free, they're open to everyone. So when you publish our episodes, um, it really just goes out into the internet for, for those who are interested. We, we focus on interviews about the academic life and research and we're really trying to make the content accessible um, in a non-reading format off the computer, so to say. We also partnered last year with the International Association for the Study of the Commons and the International Journal of the Commons as their official podcast. 
So we have different types of content on the website. We have full episodes, which feature long, about one hour interviews, usually featuring one guest about their research, kind of in a past, present, future type of model. And then we have insight episodes, which are really shorter clips from those longer episodes, which we kind of repost later, kind of best of or interesting excerpts from the full episodes. We also have a PEX uh, program on ecosystem change in society webinar series run by Michael Schoon. And these are methods video webinars um, on specific topics presented by uh, specific individuals. We also have a format called commenting episodes, which are more group discussions around certain thematic topics or areas with a larger group. And we have now starting a journal episode series, which features uh, interviews with authors who have published in the International Journal of the Commons about their work and, and additional things which might not have been present in the paper themselves. And that's currently being run by uh, Frank von Leerhoven. So here you can see our team. We are slowly growing uh, into a diverse group. Uh, we have uh, six different co-hosts, um, as I mentioned before, on the various different podcast series, and two now blog editors and contributors, um, as there's also a blog as part of our team, uh, Pranita and Graham Epstein. So what values does the podcast provide? Generally, we've been thinking about knowledge mobilization, so things like providing science literacy, disseminating knowledge about specific topics and projects, but also to really connect with other people and to find uh, others who work on similar interests and perspectives as we do. Um, also to remove gatekeepers and barriers to the exchange of knowledge, which you might find in other traditional academic formats. It's also this goal of advocacy, perhaps, and maybe not just in our podcast, but other science podcasts in general, to push certain ideas, perspectives, goals, such as sustainability, conservation, livelihoods, or advance certain ideas on methods and theories as being useful. Um, there's also this idea of science as storytelling, so finding fun ways to engage away from the computer with science um, and science-related topics, and to connect with others beyond our local spheres, places in other parts of the world, other institutes, etc and to really share our stories and experiences that can put the person back into the science, can put the personality and the history of individuals back into the science and the research that they do, and to build really close digital communities um, using these new tools that we have now. And one of the main important um, aspects of the podcast is really to promote diverse voices, to really provide a platform for, for sharing in a diverse community. So what are the main challenges? Practical challenges, learning to produce skills, building an audience, time, coordination, translation of science and audio stories. There's also the institutional values. So shifting to recognize other science outputs and institutional support and overcoming openness barriers in scientific culture and how we talk about and share knowledge. So we have some questions for you. How podcasts help you find other topics and ideas with your work? What would you invest time in listening, being interviewed or producing a podcast? Would your institution support a podcast? Can podcasting become a mainstream academic tool? Um, some reflections which you might address in the discussion on the session. So thank you. Please encourage you to check out our podcast website if you're interested in exploring it more. You can find us on social media or feel free to reach out to myself or Michael Cox if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Well, that concludes all of our talks. So if um, all of my panelists can go ahead and get their video up, we'll just take a minute to get everyone situated and then we'll go ahead and kind of start the panel discussion. There were a few questions um, in the chat, but they're actually all from Rudy. So I'm sure we'll get to those in the panel discussion here. All right, I'm gonna make sure I just have everybody pinned and that it looks okay. Um, if anyone, um, all of everyone participating, you probably are pretty familiar with Zoom now, but if you uh, would rather not just see my face on the screen, go ahead and uh, go up to the, the right corner to the view and, and put in the gallery view so you can see everyone. All right. So uh, the first question, um, and just so the audience knows, uh, we, we do have some, some predetermined questions. Um, so I know each of us in our talks um, kind of alluded to like why we went ahead with the, these initiatives, right? And we have all these community, um, you know, inclusiveness and, and diversifying, getting to know one another. 
but each of you um, kind of already knew going into these type of initiatives that it was going to take a lot of volunteer time and a lot of time out of your day. So with that in mind, I was wondering if maybe I'm just thinking between Stefan and, and Wiley, or sorry, Stefan and, uh, and Michael and maybe Emma, um, given yours, like some of these others are all volunteer hours. Um, what was kind of the, the motivation behind it? And, and how has that translated to the amount of time and effort you're putting into it? Because all of your work is very extensive and very well done. I mean, producing a podcast is unreal. Um, and just the sheer amount of people that Emma, you have in the Marine Social Science Network and that it's so global. And if anyone is unfamiliar with the marine sciences, they're often overlooked, but they have a huge and very active community, um, both in scholarship and online and social media. We're all kind of <clears throat> awkwardly unmuting ourselves at the same time now. Uh, Kenny, you can hear me pretty well. I'm wearing new headphones so I can hear myself. I mean, I think for me, I mean, I agree that there is this there's the public motivation you have, and then there's kind of the personal motivation that you have. And so you kind of, to me, just talked about what the public motivation is. And that's what we've been talking about. I mean, honestly, for me, it was, I had just gone through the tenure process at Dartmouth and I was ready to get off like the PDF treadmill a little bit and feel more connected with people than sometimes I did with my Kind of regular research program. I've talked to Stefan a lot about how uh, I feel like our interviews are artisanal interviews where we're getting back to really connecting with people. And in my own work, I had gotten away from that where each, you know, the, the interview respondents were all kind of rows on a spreadsheet that I was going to then analyze statistically. And I had kind of gotten away from the human connection that had really gotten me into the field in the first place. It's like learning about people's stories and engaging with them without worrying about causal inference, uh, first and foremost. And so um, the human connection piece and also just, uh, you know, being in a space where I wanted to try to also nudge what's valued in academia. So um, not you know, benefiting from my own privileged position as not needing to kind of crank as many papers as maybe I used to, but then trying to use the project to, to signal to other people that this is something that's valuable. And you know, that's why partly why we're interested in connecting with the International Journal of the Commons. Like we are aware that like making these connections to more traditional outlets is a good way to signal that. I think it's good to make those connections. Um, but I think we do need to move away from, we need to diversify the kinds of outputs that are seen as legitimate by academics, because we know that there's value in these things. And so we should make it easier for people to seek out and produce that value. And I think a good way to do it is, is to do it yourself. Yeah, I would, I would agree with all those comments. I mean, this is, in terms of the time, I mean, they're all, I think probably Emma as well and Michael and I, we usually underestimate the amount of time that it takes to get started with these things. But, you know, as the momentum builds, uh, you know, over the first year or so, probably both of ours at least, it really becomes pretty rewarding then. I mean, it's this provision of the public good. We, they're so valuable. All the projects that were presented today are providing a huge amount of value, but there's no real incentives. Um, I mentioned it in the slide that there's not too many institutional incentives, and Michael just mentioned it now that like recognizing that diff the different types of values that we get from that. And that's a project we're actually working on now that Michael's leading to think about uh, podcasts and the diverse uh, values that we get out of them. Um, and this, I think also this idea of this PDF production that Michael mentioned before, and we do so much reading and we, we put so much written content out there and there's often a lack of like a, a person behind the science that we do. And we often forget that um, you can just call someone and ask them. Um, it's, it's a little bit harder during the last year or so to meet up in person. And maybe the podcast has even been better for that in that sense that you can really try to connect and get deeper with people. I mean, you can be colleagues with someone for a really long time, but still not sit down and really ask them about, hey, how did you get to where you were? Like, what's your story? What's your, 
Uh, you can really know someone and, and work with them for a long time and, and still not get to really understand their history and trajectory and decisions that they made. And I think our podcast has been helpful for really understanding why we ask the type of questions we do in our science, et cetera. Um, and then allowing people to really bond and link to each other and think, oh, this, this is person's more similar than, than I thought. And I, I think that's one lesson from our podcast. We, people are, we're more similar to each other than different in the sense of our, our thoughts and journeys through uh, all of our careers. Um, yeah, thanks, Emma, you wanna add something? Oh, Steph, I gotta say one thing, sorry, Emma. It's real quick. I just, I will say it's been incredibly humbling to realize how many like impressive people are out there doing like amazing things. Like we all think we're doing cool stuff and then you interview people like, holy crap. There's a lot of really cool, thoughtful people out there doing really interesting things. So it's that it's inspiring and that helps you keep going. All right, that's, I just want to add that. For sure. Um, our, so our um, rationale for starting was, was maybe a little bit different. And there was a, a feeling in that workshop that I mentioned that there wasn't a lot of awareness of marine social sciences in the UK at the time. I had had a conversation a couple of years earlier with the head, the chief of our kind of main government department of marine science. And she, she was a social scientist and she said, we were a big annual conference. She said, oh, but there must only be 10 people working on marine social sciences in the UK. And I was like, I could literally point out 20 people in this room right now without even thinking about it. But you don't know that and you don't know that those people are doing that. And that's a clearly an issue and that's clearly a problem. So it kind of stemmed out of that about needing to raise visibility and create a community because a number of the comments that were coming back was that people working in that field felt a bit isolated they were often one person in a department and I know that's the case in other environmental social sciences as well but it meant our rationale was maybe a little bit different so it was about creating a, a space and a community for marine social scientists um, to just raise the profile, have the conversations, create the opportunity for those conversations and create a bit of an identity. And I think that identity was there, but I think maybe we've just um, made it a bit louder and we've talked about it a bit more over the last couple of years. Um, and then in terms of the personal connections, that's definitely something that has become much more important over the last 12 months, as of course everybody would expect. That's why the book club started. So our book club began as a complete reaction to the first COVID lockdowns last March um, and to me getting quite concerned about all of the let's publish seven night um, nature and science papers in the next six weeks kind of rhetoric that was going round around academia and a bit like that is not going to be good for people's brains can we please all just recognize that this is all a big big thing that's happening right now and the book club we're on our 15th book we meet every month so there's a group of about 20 25 of us that you know depending on who's available meet up every month and have that conversation have really gotten to know each other so that personal connection those stories are, are really important for us as well oh in the terms of time so much time i now have like <laughs> a four person comms team all volunteers who are amazing and without them i don't know how i used to do the newsletter on my own i did a lot of sunday mornings like yeah a lot of time <laughs> yeah i think it's important for us all to recognize how much volunteer time for any aspect of what we do in academia and practice comes into play but for for jessica and, and mia and ashley and wiley and then rudy i know his video went down but he might still be on I was wondering, our initiatives are a little like we have a like we're trying to understand the the diversity of professionalism within the these fields. But I also wondered um, with regards to that, if you know Jessica with the, the extreme events and, and natural disaster researchers, if for example, you've noticed people becoming having more personal connections, you know, things being shared. Um, you know, in different ways with that network. And then I know Nia, we're, you know, we're just getting up and running, but I know Ashley has done some things with smaller groups within the, the directory. Um, so I was just wondering if, if either of you had things to share about that. So go ahead, Jessica. Thanks. Um, so we are, we are about two, I think, actually we're entering our third year right now. Um, and we are, um, we are not yet in the phase of um, that Emma and, and others have talked about where you're you're actually getting people together and you know doing book clubs or doing other social events. Um, I do want to um, note that last year we funded um, um, 
work groups to look at different aspects of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and we ended up funding 90 of those work groups. Um, and <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, and um, you know, I, I like to think that the SEER network was really helpful in sort of bringing those people together because you know, some of these group work groups were just two or three people, but some of them were these massive 20 people work groups um, looking at different aspects of the pandemic. And um, so hundreds upon hundreds of people working together in, in different ways to look, at to look at these very small pieces. So um, I would like to think that it was instrumental in that. Um, and as far as um, other initiatives to get people involved, we um, would like to work on a, we're calling it a data challenge to bring in undergraduate and graduate researchers um, to kind of take our data and play with it and say, okay, what, what are you finding in this data that's interesting to you? Because we have so much of it, 1200 people's worth. Um, so we're just kind of starting to get involved in in those events that are bringing people together. Um, but I know we're always looking for um, new ways to get especially early career professionals involved. This is Rudy and I'm, I'm sorry I'm having connection problems at the moment. So my video is, is off. Can everybody hear me now? Yep, excellent. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think with the Department of Interior, particularly, one of the things that we're very concerned about is, is not being redundant. And, and so you think about like, you know, just how many different community practices are out there, you know, especially now with the pandemic, how many different webinars are you invited to, how many different conversations are already happening and, and trying to not be redundant with those or you know to be you know clear to to not mess mess with success there are other groups out there that are doing a great job or other meetings that are doing a great job so just trying to you know again navigating the human dimensions landscape kind of like navigating the community of practice landscape and saying how can we add to the conversation or add to the network and and not add burden at the same time that's a really good point. Um, so kind of from the conservation social science um, community network, we've um, in the state agency world, we had for a really long time, just this kind of giant email listserv that we would ask questions of all the state agency conservation social scientists we knew, but we actually moved through kind of using the network, we moved that over to Slack. And so like, our network really spurred on this more targeted network of state agency social science people in Slack. And then we've had lots of, we've, I don't know how many people are familiar with Slack, but it's been great because we've been able to have like smaller discussions within Slack because the network itself is not really built for that, but we've been able to take it to a new location using the network as a starting point. And the cool thing about the network is that we were able, you know, this smaller group of state agency social science folks were able to see other state agency social science folks through the network. So it was kind of cool. That's one kind of way that we we did that or I did that in my in my last position and I'm kind of continuing to stay involved there because now I'm kind of by myself at a, a regional bird conservation organization. So kind of starting off and hopefully there'll be more social scientists that um, join those organizations. Yeah, I just wanted to, to jump in real quick. Uh, so Shorna asked a question in the chat about the organizational level. Um, and I can speak to just a, a bit of what I've done for our conservation social science map. Um, I've myself just put in organizations in the map, um, but that's a good question. And, and maybe for the rest of you as well. Um, you know, a lot of we're Obviously, we're talking about individuals and professionals and things like that, but we know that there's a lot of um, centers and institutes and you know, academic units, as well as some of the private sector um, consultancy groups and things like that. I was just wondering for, for the other networks, um, if anything has happened at the organizational level, if you've just stayed at the sort of 
individual level or if you've tried to, to reach out to some of the um, institutional level, organizational level to partner with them or just even to, to acknowledge that they exist um, and to try to maybe just connect with them as well. I can come in on that. Yeah, we so right from the very beginning, we um, we had a number of international organizations represented in that initial 35 people workshop, which is what made us go, oh, thinking in the UK is not really going to work. We got to think bigger than that. Um, and so we had, I guess what we called supporting organizations or, you know, a list of or, or a number of um, organizations that we named on our website. I think that's actually now changed in the last couple of years, but they included groups like Future Earth Coasts and um, the United Nations Environment Programme, World Conservation Monitoring Centre and the Royal Geographical Society, WWF UK, groups that we knew and we'd talked to that you know, that kind of really appreciated the, the development of the group, the formation of Mars Oxai. Um, and those groups, it's really informal. They kind of reach out to us if there's something they would like us to promote. And we do the same. We work quite closely with Future Earth Coast, for example. Um, so yeah, there's nothing formal that we do, but I think it would be something that would be great if we could do more of. Um, we're very much, or at least I'm very much one for not recreating the wheel and not doing something that we, on my own that we could all do together because that's only going to you know as I said in my talk we're, we're all trying to do the same thing really um so yeah I think it'd be great if, if we could think about that more strategically um and think about how those organizations can have really um structured conversations to think about how we get those benefits and create those connections and, and multiple benefits really this is Rudy. And from the two sides, from HDGov and the DOI SBE community of practice, HDGov, yeah, we're constantly trying to find more people. And I think we've, you know, now gotten to the point where, for example, we have, you know, NASA and created some new concepts to the human dimensions of Earth observation, where it's just exciting and, and gaining the traction with that group to where that group is really stabilized. As I said, that HDGov website is almost two decades old and, and to be where it is now took a great deal of work and, and effort. The Department of Interior side, actually we're a little bit on, on the opposite side of how do you manage a group like this? Because when I said that the, the economists got together, you know, four or so years ago and had their first economics workshop for just Department of Interior, it was about 70 people attended that workshop. And, and if you look at how many economists there are in the Department of Interior, there's maybe 80. That's a tenable number, 80 people to manage as, as an actual group of individuals that are interacting. And when we pulled the numbers for the people who have an 01 series job designation in, in, in the Department of Interior, and what that means is if the 01 series is the general social science series. And there were more than 1,500 people in the Department of Interior that were some kind of social scientist across all the bureaus and offices. And so we, we really struggled with the, the planning committee particularly, and then with the, the larger um, uh, kickoff event that we had, the planning committee, trying to figure out, you know, who are we and what are we? And how, how do we, can we serve all of those people? Because in 01 series, you know, it could be, you know, anthropologists and sociologists, but also, and economists, but also librarians and clinical sociologists or, or clinical psychologists and people like that. So, so we really struggled with defining ourselves and, and creating an identity that's manageable and actionable. Uh, I can say to touch on Shora's question, there are some other good uh, organizations out there. One is the Maritime Center in, in Amsterdam, which is a primarily a group of uh, European research centers, but they organize more on the institutional level and they're actually having their uh, biannual conference next week. I believe them, I think you're also gonna be a part of that. It's a really great conference for marine social science, anyone who's working fisheries, aquaculture, et cetera. I can put the link in the chat. And then there's also the Pollen, which is the political ecology network. And I believe they also have, um, a map that you can add at the institutional level. You can search and see um, 
yeah, who is basically involved in, and then you can click and see which individuals are within those institutions who, who are participating. I can put also the link in the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, anyone in the audience, if you have any questions, go ahead and, and throw them in the chat. Um, I wanted to just also ask uh, Mia and Wiley maybe, um, I know, you know, in our initiative, it was kind of weird how how we all got connected, but I was I was wondering if you all had any thoughts on given that experience why we weren't connected, and and then maybe also from your previous experiences in your in your past positions on the reasons why we weren't all connected before and why we're struggling with it now, and then maybe everyone else can maybe chime in afterwards because I think that's an interesting question because it, it would seem easy to be to know who everybody is, but as we found out, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, um, I can start with that one. From my perspective, you know, when I was working for Florida Fish and Wildlife, it was kind of the first position of its kind. So apart from the colleagues that I had in grad school and people that I met at conferences, I didn't know anybody else in that specific state government social science role. I knew that there had to be others, um, but there wasn't something, there wasn't a directory I could go to. Uh, so sometimes you just don't know who you don't know. Uh, and I think that that's kind of how a lot of these initiatives get started. It's the acknowledgement that you know there are other people out there, but how do we connect them all? And I, and I do want to call back to a previous question too. I think what's important, because Rudy mentioned, you know, not reinventing the wheel and trying to find a lane to stay in. That's sort of the benefit of where we are in technology right now is that we can have individual networks and efforts that are slightly different from each other. But now, you know, you have Twitter, you can connect everybody through that. So we don't necessarily need to start doing, uh, you know, organizational level additions to our directory. We can keep it individual because there are other ones out there, but we can all communicate about these things, which I think will help future folks who are starting out in a position or like, I know there are people, but where are they? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that, that I, I was in a very similar position to Neo when I started my position with the Fish and Wildlife Service. I was the, the first and only social scientist for an entire region, so 10 states, um, and, and uh, new to the region in particular, and so really just didn't even know who was working in that space and didn't have an established network to build off of. I think the other thing that, that we've talked a lot about within our uh, network is that often being that first only, you know, one of maybe one or two people, uh, you're just inundated with requests to work on all sorts of different things. And so having the ability to know where your colleagues are and, and have a relationship with them. So it's easy to call them up and say, hey, you know, I, I just got asked to work on this. And this is a totally new, you know, subject area for me. Do you know anything about it? Or do you have any resources you could share with me? is really helpful because often, you know, it's a, a quick turnaround time. It's, um, it's, it's very applied work. So going out and finding all of the, the academic research and then translating that in a way that makes sense for, you know, say a, a manager at a national wildlife refuge or something like that can be really, really difficult. And so I think that's part of the other reason, Kenny, that it, it can be tough to connect with people is, is folks are just kind of buried in the day to day. And so having a resource like this that makes it really easy to find people and connect with them and build those relationships is really helpful. Yeah, I also wanted to ask uh, Jessica and Rudy in particular, um, have you found like, so in, in looking through your initiatives and, and sort of trying to understand the landscape of expertise and, and the diversity of professionals. Um, I was wondering if you had, if there were any surprises, like Rudy, you mentioned like clinical psychologists and things like that. Um, I just wondered with, with Jessica, with your initiative, if there were any surprises or unexpected uh, forms of, of diversity or variation, um, or if you found sort of kind of the traditional sociology, anthropology, psychology, political science as being dominant within, um, and Rudy, you might have the economists as well being dominant within DOI, but I just wondered if that was the case or if we are finding that things are much more diverse than we initially thought. Um, yeah, so I, so first I want to um, 
answer, I saw Rudy's question in the chat about disaster science. Um, and we're seeing a lot of disaster scientists um, in answer to your question, Kenny, as expected. Um, disaster science is kind of this umbrella term and it's these newly emerging programs. Um, sometimes they're within traditional academic disciplines like um, the, Lu the Louisiana State University um, Department of Anthropology and Geography hosts a disaster science specialty, um, but more and more they are emerging as their own kind of um, discipline. And what they're concerned with is um, looking at from an interdisciplinary lens, um, the effects of extreme events on natural built and social environments. Um, so their ultimate outcome is to better prepare people to withstand disaster, to respond to disaster, um, and to mitigate um, to the extent possible. Um, so in answer to Kenny's question, um, we, like I was saying in my talk, we were trying to keep a really broad idea of what the social sciences are. And that's something that a number of you mentioned as well. Um, but in our survey, we, we have 23 disciplines, so you can check off this is my discipline and people can answer more than one. So, um, you know, we have the traditional social sciences, sociology, geography, anthropology, et cetera. Um, I think a big surprise for me is how many people actually consider themselves to be um, truly interdisciplinary. We don't have a lot of people just checking off one sort of main um, discipline that they work in. So somebody will say, you know, I work in a department of sociology, but they'll also check off anthropology and they'll check off, you know, um, economics and things like that. So um, I think people are truly starting to really consider themselves discipline, interdisciplinary, even if they identify with one, um, you know, overall sort of department. Um, and the same thing with methodologies. Um, we don't, I don't think there is, a single person in our data set who has just said, I use this one method and this method only, you know, the, the number of disciplines that, or the number of uh, methodologies that people check off that they um, practice with are really um, wide and variable, um, which maybe shouldn't be surprising, but um, it's actually really cool to see that. So, yeah, I, it wasn't necessarily surprising to me. I, I'm in a position where I get to interact with a lot of other institutions within the government as well as outside. So I had a pretty good sense of, of what the breadth was of, of people out there. For, for us in the SBE, for, for the Department of Interior Community Practice, really the problem was getting beyond those traditional disciplines. And, and as you could imagine, if, if you limit to the 01 series of social science, you're really excluding a lot of people. And you know, for example, someone could be a recreation planner who works for the Park Service or for the Bureau of Land Management who needs social science information to help them literally make their plans and make decisions, but they're not, that's not an 01 series. So really for us, it, it was a little bit of the opposite of how do you target your market, so to speak, or identify the, the community that, that you can provide a service to and then get those people that are, that are, that should be associated with it that aren't as easy to identify and define so that you can really provide information to the folks who need it. Yeah, I see we've got a little conversation going on in the chat. So um, I wanted to leave the next, uh, the last sort of 15, 10 minutes um, to you all to ask each other questions. So Michael, if you wanted to kick things off since you already did in the chat, maybe expand upon what you all are talking about there. Yeah, sure. This is something that Stefan and I have talked about for a while. We've experimented with a version of it on a previous website. There's, it, it's just, I've had many times where I've, I knew that if I could just find, if I could have five minutes with the right person, I could save myself like five hours of whatever it is, right? And so it's just, it's kind of this missing market um, within social science communities and expertise. And so it really would be great to have 
um, you know, it's kind of like a matching market. You want someone who's got the expertise and someone who's got the question. I know like ResearchGate does this as well. I've not used that very much, but I've, I've wondered whether there could be like a conservation environmental social scientist specific forum. And maybe it's, you know, maybe there's sections that are about specific advice, but there's also like uh, broader questions that people have that aren't specific to like a technique, et cetera. Um, but we've thought about it, we've not implemented it because just it's, it's, it would be a whole big thing to do well, I think. Although I saw in the, in the, in the chat, this, um, the idea of using Slack and building on what's already being done. Like we use Slack for our own small project. I know many people who do. It's, I, I think it's a terrific idea. I don't know if it's like scalable because I know that these places, they bite you once you jump to the enterprise level. That's how they get their money. So I don't know how that would work. But I would love it. Yeah, I actually, so going back to kind of the state agency, social science Slack, honestly, you know, one state agency person put it together to kind of get away from our, our listserv, the, our dinosaur. And then we're working off of a free trial. None of us have an institutional membership. So we don't know really um, how sustainable it is. And also too, it's been really hard to garner um, interaction and participation because there are so many different things. Right now um, with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, there's also this relevancy kind of forum that they're constantly sending papers and asking questions. And so we don't want people to view this as just another thing they have to do, but to view it as something that's helpful. And so I think that's hard too, is that there's just so many different networks and finding the one that's kind of most useful to you and so I think that's kind of what we're getting into right now. And I don't, I don't know, um, yeah, how, how long this is going to last for, for that, for our group. Yeah, I just wanted to point out, um, it's just coincidence, just like this session is like so aligned with the theme of the conference. There's another um, session later today. It's called the offers and needs market. Um, I'm, I'm signed up for it. Um, so if you're interested, uh, everybody online attending and then all the panelists, check that out in the agenda for the conference. Because I've looked at that and I thought, oh, maybe that's useful. And then Michael made his comment and I was like, maybe that's what we're looking for or something akin to that. So uh, you might sign up for that. I don't know. I don't know anything about it. I'm just sort of going in and learning. So but anyway, yeah, continue the conversation. Um, I'm going to let you all have full reign for the next uh, eight or so minutes that the panel is, is going on. So feel free to ask each other questions or answer previous questions or just do a stream of consciousness if you've got that going on. I know it looks really great. One of the, one of the, and actually quick question, these are being recorded, right, Kenny? So we could go back for those of us like out of time zone. Yep, everything, I'm gonna get the recording and cut it down. Um, and then, yeah, I'll send it to everybody and then I'll give it to the conference and I think they'll post it on the website or their YouTube or something. Great. Yeah, it seems like one of the three, the themes through this is, like how disciplinary orientation, while that has many benefits of become trained in a specialized area, once you kind of get beyond the PhD, and for me that's you know still pretty early on as early career, just figuring this out, you really start working more on problems, and like thinking about how do we can connect more on problems and rather on discipline, um, is something that seems pretty important for something like a matching market or something like this needs. It's really like I'm not. I mean, I'm not trying to connect necessarily with another political scientist or find other political scientists. I'm trying to find someone who works on aquaculture or I'm trying to find someone who works on urban planning. Um, and that seems to be something that all the networks are kind of touching on with some of them are thematic, but even within the themes like green social science, for example, you know, it's pretty broad. There's a lot of folks in there. Um, yeah, and it, it seems, you know, during the interviews with the podcast too, that so many people work on a diverse range of problems and that's really difficult to somehow find out. Um, I often have the problem that because um, we ask people to send us their some recent publications when we do their interviews with them but this is usually work that's you know been done three four years ago and it's hard to really know some of the, the topics which people are working on at the moment because none of that stuff gets published until down the road and so something like this would be really useful I don't know if that's matching other people's uh, shift that we need to have this meta move in academia towards problem and solution oriented uh, education, learning, et cetera, and away from disciplines. I think it's probably the way things are going to go with all that, with the, with the you know, that increasing focus on inter and transdisciplinarity and thinking about how we can 
deal with all these big environmental and societal challenges that are also interconnected. So I do think it's it, it probably will go a bit more problem solving. I mean, one of the projects I work on at the moment is to do with eutrophication in Vietnam, and I am in no way somebody who's an expert in eutrophication, but they needed someone who could do some social science work alongside the natural science work. And it, you know, you it's about dealing with a bigger challenge than um kind of the just understanding perceptions for example it's bringing it all together so i think it probably will move in that way and um, in terms of the, the how we can give advice in the q a and the interaction we we actually have tested and tried out a few options so we tried to set up a research gate project for mars oxi so that everybody could you know, try and facilitate that conversation and try and share knowledge so that we weren't having to manage it and kind of be the moderators of it as much and it was really, really difficult to do that in a way that wasn't going to be really onerous for everybody signing up. Like you had to be connected to everybody who was part of the project and it, it just was going to cause loads of problems. We've, we have talked about things like LinkedIn. And um, the thing that's most successful I put in the chat is, is that people use the hashtags. And actually just the other day, somebody put in a hashtag about using story maps and actually, yeah, and loads of people replied really, really quickly. It was amazing to see it kind of happen. I think it was on Thursday or Friday and it, it all suddenly started going out got a life of its own so it can work but of course it's one platform that not everybody uses which does limit limit access to a lot of people um so I think it'd be great if we could think of ways I mean we're also looking at developing a, um, what we're calling a demystifying marine social sciences um piece and, and of course our work is very much focused on the marine and coast um but you know trying to help answer some of those frequently answered questions, I guess, to try and address some of those terminology issues, those methodology issues in a piece that's maybe put on the website or in a document, um, but it's not something we've figured out in any detail yet. It's there, definitely a work in progress. Any advice, any suggestions are very welcome. <laughs> and I think that those, those issues, you know, within USGS, you know, again, fortunate working with very interdisciplinary groups and, and large issues, like you're saying in, in Vietnam, we're, we've been working in the Mekong Delta for years on, you know, some data sharing issues and river management. And it's there, those efforts are huge. And I think a challenge for these community of practices that we have set up is making those connections are are difficult, right? Because if you have a map, you know, if somebody has a need for social science in a place like Asia, any place in, in, a, in a location, finding the person who's capable of doing that work might not be place-based, right? Because the person who's capable of working in the lower Mekong River basin might, you know, probably doesn't live there, right? They, they're from someplace else, you know, and, and how can these communities then facilitate those connections? Yeah, Jessica, yeah, was something I was thinking about with, uh, with all the projects, it's like the more open that we can keep these projects and the more um, accessible we can do that. I know I realize a lot of people work in the United States, but this, the theme of the conference and the theme of a lot of these like community building activities is, is to reduce the barriers of access, especially for, for those in, working in the global south and in countries where barriers to access to science and access to conferences and access to journals and all these things are actually really high. And it's even high for our own partners, et cetera, um, to where they can feel like connected and they can get into it and connect on Twitter and things like that. It, I think that seems to be something we need to continue to push forward. Jessica, I was wondering with SC, is, is that part of the initiative there to be able to connect people on the ground for, for actual disaster events? Yeah, absolutely. And, and just thinking about what Rudy was saying, um, are we, that's one of our major concerns is are we actually connecting people who are affected by a disaster in this community? Um, researchers in local community, I have to apologize. I have a very young cat and he's very, uh, vocal and uh, gets bored very easily. So if you hear him yelling, that's that's okay. It's just who he is. Um, so you know, uh, like I mentioned, eighty more than eighty percent of our SCR researchers are located in the Americas, and you know we can see 
from because we asked people what events they study, we see that most of the people who study events that are outside of the Americas, that they aren't researchers in those areas. They're people coming from the Americas to um, to study those disasters, and, and that that can be problematic, um, you know, in terms of you know cultural competence, in terms of um, are these people really being heard? Are these people really um, working with the communities that they're actually in? And and we're finding that that's that's kind of not the case most of the time. So. Um, this that's definitely part of our our mission for outreach is to connect with those researchers on the ground when there is a disaster so that they can have a voice in in the research that's being done in their community um, especially when there are outside researchers coming in um, i think it was um i want to say new zealand um banned outside researchers um, for a time after disasters because, you know, they were just getting this influx of people. And um, yeah, so there are definitely um, advantages to making sure you have the right people in those places. Yeah, I just wanted to note for everyone, we're at time, um, but the panelists will just stay on for a few more minutes. So if you want to stay on as well, please do. But We'll try to keep the conference rolling. I'm not sure what the, if there's a break scheduled after these first sessions, but um, yeah, um, thanks, Jessica. That's I, I know that from talking with you and, and Lori that that's like one of your big things with disaster events is getting people connected who are actually working on the ground and then dealing with that and the issues of, of local researchers and sort of a lot of what we deal with in conservation and it's the, the parachute science. Um, so that's something that we're trying to be aware of as well. Um, I just wondered for everybody else on the panel, is there any other topic or question that you had um, that you wanted to chat a bit more? We're at time. I know if everybody has a schedule for today, if you need to go, no worries. But if you wanted to ask uh, one of the other panelists a question or chat about something else, um, I know, Stefan, you've mentioned maybe thinking about what this panel can do in terms of a next step, um, if, if that includes some type of paper or something like that. But I just uh, would leave the door open to anybody right now if we want to stay over a few more minutes. I'm probably good. This is Rudy. And I just like to thank everybody for participating and, and having this conversation. And, and Kenny, thanks for um, organizing the session and all your effort to get us here today. Yeah, thank yeah you. same from my side, Kenny. Thanks a lot for organizing all this and putting it together and all the, the effort behind it. And like Stefan, I'd be interested in continuing the conversation moving forward. It's been nice to have this to build momentum. It'd be nice to see what we want to do next. Yeah, I agree. I think that the idea that Stefan put forward about the idea of like reconstructing and why we need these communities and, and what that says about academia and the relationship between research and policy and practice and all those different communities, I think it'd be great to explore some of that further. So we'd be really happy to have conversations with you guys and anybody else who's interested. Yeah, this idea of rebuilding communities. You know, we have communities. Um, they're often limited to where we work and to what we, we see on a daily basis. And that there's this need now where we have bigger problems, we focus on different scales uh, and those scales are, could have, they interact across different levels. Um, thinking about what we would need and which types of platforms address those and what specifically um, are the gaps would be something interesting, I think. So, and if you'd be interested in taking a lead on that, feel free. We'll see how things go, but I know Nia and, and Ashley and Wiley and I have written a short piece. Um, so we're all thinking about, you know, for our sort of little myopic sort of human dimensions, US-based stuff, um, but just drawing attention to all this stuff and making sure people understand, you know, that what we work in is not necessarily within the confines of some specific discipline. Go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, we're, I was just saying that, you know, the social science folks in um, organizations outside of academia, a lot of time we feel really, really isolated um, we have, you know, sometimes it's easy to connect to researchers, but hard to kind of get access to 
documents and to connect to, to one another and also to make sure you know there's a lot of research coming out that at the in the discussion that says this is applicable to managers yet we weren't kind of included in the conversation so it's there's really there's really a kind of applied um slash university gap sometimes and so i think that it's really important to kind of continue to have those conversations as well and i'm finding that even more in my new position is like, oh my gosh, there's so much social science research happening in my region, which is awesome, but everything is just a little bit too high level for the what we need. And so anyways, I was just, just wanted to say that. I totally, I mean, that resonates really strongly with me. Sometimes I wish like for like some journals could lead the charge here and say, if you wanna submit like a case study or certain things, like you need to have a section it's actually been like evaluated for how helpful it is to someone who might use this. Yeah, it's it's interesting. So I actually really don't appreciate the management implication section on certain on on many um, journals because it forces people to make inference and make statements that aren't actually true because they feel mm. like they have to. Um, so I would much rather just leave that out so that people don't feel like their case study can be applicable to all these people or or whatever and so we've so actually what would you want instead ashley like what nothing so <laughs> you know i mean if it's a plot like if it's a if it's really applicable if it's really co-produced say that um and talk about how you have worked with organizations rather than, than just getting funded by them um hmm. but but yeah, so we've we've actually been pushing to not have a separate section and that you really should be integrating all these applications within the body of your manuscript. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you, Ashley. I'm working with Idaho Fishing Game more and more. Every time we build um, uh, a survey, you know, human dimension survey for their management plans, I'm always asking them. They're like, oh, we can ask these questions. We can ask these questions. I'm like, are you going to use them? So like, are they going to help inform your management plan or your management objectives? And if the answer is no, then we don't need to put them in there. Um, but yeah, even as an AE, I see some of the management implication sections now in a different light. And I'm just like, man, have I been doing that same thing where I just, just all kind of bullshit. So, <laughs> so anyway, I don't know how that take is from, from, from Europe for like Emma and Stefan for a lot of what you are doing, but here in the U S you know, that's kind of one of these things where we have kind of this disconnect um, between a lot of what, what Wiley and Ashley and Nia and I kind of do. It's hard. I mean, that work. It's hard. I mean, it's hard when you study governance and management problems then to kind of present it in a neutral way. I found that really challenging. Um, a lot of my cases have been looking at other countries and looking at cases of, you know, how their structures are organized, looking over time, how things evolve and change in those structures. And, um, you know, especially because reviewer comments also always often come back and say, hey, well, say something here, but like, you know the most about this apparently uh, in your article. So, I find it a really, I understand, I see definitely both sides. So it's, it's good to hear that perspective, actually. Uh, yeah, really helpful. I mean, a lot of my work actually sort of says to people, what can we do to help management? So we sort of set the recommendations out because we've asked those questions, but it's really, because it's actually something I think of when I review papers, I'm like, and how are you going to apply this? So it's really helpful to see that from the other side though, and to see that actually sometimes that question's not helpful and that it's not relevant. And that's really useful for me as well as a reviewer. So every day is a school day. Thank you, Ashley. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I do on the academic side see that there's a lot of pressure for uh, institutional pressure for like trying to make things applied uh, or describe their applied implications even though maybe not the, the core study or the core focus of your study um i don't know if anyone else gets that impression but uh also in funding calls and things like that writing up proposals to really you have to kind of sell how it's going to be applied or how it can be practically used even though in the end you might just be doing kind of what you what we've always done maybe <laughs> more just descriptive type of analytical research but um i don't know if this is a good or bad thing yeah so, so one of the things oh sorry why go ahead I emma oh okay I, I was just gonna say real quickly i think you know one of the things that i, I know you know probably nia rudy i think you do this every day but ashley you know we've all experienced is trying to help 
folks within agencies even ask the right questions, right? So part of this conversation is it, it cuts both ways. You know, Ashley was saying a lot of times the, the research isn't as applicable to the management as we would like. And as Kenny pointed out, a lot of times the managers don't even know the right questions to ask to get at what they're actually interested in, in doing. And I think that that's, you know, a lot of the work that those of us that are social scientists embedded in agencies are constantly doing is trying to help negotiate that translation and work uh, between academia and, and the agencies. So maybe that's a follow-up conversation that we could have is how do we better how do we better bridge that divide? How do we help the academic community better understand the actual needs of managers and, and help managers better understand, you know, what this, I feel like what I do a lot of is helping managers better understand what the social sciences are and how they can actually inform the issues that they're working on. So I'd, I'd certainly be interested in that as a, as a continuing conversation with, with you all. Yeah, it seems like that might, yeah, in my head, it's working right now where it's sort of somehow a little bit dovetailing with what Stefan was talking about and what Emma was alluding to, just the idea of like not discipline so much, but problems, like thinking about it that way. Because uh, that's how I that's how I situate like all these different things that we have. Like, how do we define human dimensions? Um, you know, that's one of the things. Uh, you know, when from my position, they're like, "Oh, what do you do?" And I'm like, uh, "I do this," and I just think about it as a different way. It's I use human dimensions as a problem. Cutting in and out there, Kenny. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. We were just saying we couldn't hear you. Oh, weird. I was just oh, saying it helps. Well, I'm glad it didn't happen during the actual live panel. So, <laughs> but yeah, no, I was just saying that the human dimensions. I sort of I don't define it sort of as a as a discipline for anyone. I just define it as a way to orient yourself towards a problem, um, and so that lends itself to you know disciplines but methods as well. Um, but it also gets you in the mindset of what are, what are the questions that I need to ask about this problem, so. Um, one of the things I was gonna say uh, from a, a UK perspective is that just about this idea of impact and having to illustrate impact of, uh, you know, from academic work. Is it until I think about last year, maybe the year before, all of our um, applications had, had that impact section at the end and they've removed it with the guidance that the impact has to be integrated into the whole application and that you shouldn't have it as a separate thing, which is really challenging for people who don't think about that, for researchers and, and academics who don't think about that um, as a as standard. Um, so when we're working with particularly natural and physical science teams and we have, we have to those of us more from the social science team go, but hang on a second, like, why are we doing that? And integrating it is sometimes a little bit harder because the signposting of the impact section made them think about it a bit more clearly. So I think there are pros and cons, but I agree, actually, I quite like that it's just, it's there and you've just got to do it across the whole application. So that's now a standard across all of our UK, the main UK research councils, that, that that's how our application forms are done now. And it's just got to be integrated into the whole thing, which is quite good, I think. I could see a lot of like, oh, I mean, yeah, we've, we've been on like grant, like grant review panels and I could see someone who's like looking for the signpost as you're saying, Emma, it's like, okay, this is where I look for this. And if they don't see it, a lot of people are going to be annoyed because they're going to think, look, you're just making it harder for me to find this content and you don't want an annoyed reviewer. So I have to run shortly, this, this is Rudy, but <clears throat> going back to that conversation, as Wiley was saying, yeah, you know, a lot of the work that we do, you know, begins with that sort of consultation with, with people. They show up at the door or on the phone or wherever saying, I know I need social science, but I don't know what it looks like or sounds like or feels like or smells like or tastes like. And then we have a great conversation and at some point figure out what it looks like. There seems to have been now, which is great, a transition from those those from that sort of interaction to where now people acknowledge that they need social science and it's much more social ecological systems based. A lot of the work that we do now is, or whether it's coupled human and natural systems, whatever model you like to use, 
but that's the approach that's being taken a lot more often now where, where people are, well, or those conversations are not as much of the, you know, I need social science, come in, do it, give me the answer and leave. It's, hey, let's work together to design a project that integrates the social and natural sciences in a larger context. And, and that's a really great place to be, I think, for all of us. Um, and I hope that we keep going in that direction. So with that said, I'm going to say thank you all and have a great conference.